Um, yeah, gosh, that was just so awesome. We could just, like, okay, let's be done. <laughs> and so, because, man, the Lord's presence is so good. One of my favorite prayers um, is when Moses is on the mountainside and he's encountering the glory of God. And um, well, just before he encounters the glory of God, he prays this prayer. He says, Lord, you've been asking me to lead these people, but you haven't told me who you're going to send with me yet. Now, what else is going to distinguish me from everybody else on the face of this earth? Now show me your glory. And it was after that prayer the glory of God came. And, you know, the, the distinguishing factor of the children of God is the presence of God. That really is the distinguishing factor that separates you and me and us from everybody else on the face of this earth. Therefore, there is now no separation from the most incre incredible Papa that created all the universe because of Jesus, our hope of glory. And so the distinguishing factor of your life isn't what you can do. It's what he's already done. It's his presence. And that's why we, I mean, man, we are unafraid. Like, let's worship for a full hour, two hours, and not stop and just focus on his presence. You can't overdo his presence. It's what will change everything. And, and so I just love how our, our number one value as a church family is the glory of God. Because <laughs> we're going to worship, and everything's going to end for his glory, no matter what. And so um, this morning for our, for our training, um, I spent a lot of time actually praying about it and, and just like, Lord, what do you want to do this morning? And, and um, I really felt like the Lord kind of spoke to me and, and asked, just like, hey, I want you to walk your church family through what I'm walking you through in this season with um, kind of this injury and some of the circumstances and situations we've been facing as a family. And um, it really is actually in line with, you know, how the Lord was leading us in worship and that word mono had. Um, mono, thank you, man. That was powerful. Um, and so, um, so specifically, kind of framing it is, is, is really dominion restored through the Lord's Prayer. And, and um, uh, how many have ever had hard circumstances or situations that you've brought before the Lord in prayer, and it's kind of been like the struggle for breakthrough? How many have ever been there? Right? If you haven't, you're not human. <laughs> right? It's like, wow. Wow. And one of the temptations you have is in the struggle, and you're, you're continuing for breakthrough, is actually just to give up. And, and be like, okay, there is no breakthrough. How many have ever done that? Right. Right. And actually, the Lord's Prayer, the way Jesus coached his disciples to pray, is actually an extremely empowering tool he's given us to push, pray until something happens, to get the breakthrough that you need. And, and so I, I want to unpack that. And so um, in, in, in Matthew chapter 6, when you, when, you, when you look at what Jesus uh, taught the disciples and how to pray, if you look at the trend of Jesus' life, you look at the trend of the scripture, you look at the disciples, you look at um, the believers after the disciples, the early church, you look at Paul, every time their prayer came into alignment with the will of the Father, there was radical breakthrough and radical supply, radical answers. And that's what we want to go for, that's what we're going after as a, as a, as a church family. And so, um, we're going to unpack this. If you look at the, the life of the disciples, the only thing that the disciples specifically asked Jesus to teach them to do was what? Pray. Pray. He didn't, they didn't ask him, Jesus, teach us how to multiply you know, fish and loaves. They didn't say, teach us how to heal the leper, teach us how to cast out demons. There was all these crazy things that were changing the game that Jesus was doing. The one thing that they asked Jesus to ask them to teach them was, Lord, teach us how to pray, because they linked the fruit of his life with, the, with his prayer life. They understood, wow, when he would go and be on the mountainside and pray, things happened. 
And the scripture says that, that Jesus did so many miracles on this earth that if they were recorded in the books, this world wouldn't have enough room to hold all the miracles. So what we read in the scripture, it, it's not everything that Jesus did, but it's the things that we need to hear so that we can live the life he lived. And then we can carry on what he asked us to carry on. And so, is this making sense? So to give you a little background in, in, in just talking about this and, and going through this is, honestly, these last two weeks have been a really actually challenging last couple of weeks for myself, for Amy, um, for, for Mary, for our family, uh, for, for the Arnold family. For those of you who don't know, I tried one, I hurt my knee. And it was just like, it was not the news that I really wanted. Um, torn meniscus and a, and a partially torn PCL. And so the doctor's like, you gotta get surgery. And so I got the surgery last Thursday. And, um, and the surgery went great. The surgery went great. And so, but um, recovering from the surgery has actually been pretty challenging. It's like, man, there's a lot to do. We have three children. Um, you know, our, our house is a wreck. Right? We've got to move along. We've got to do all these things. It's been, it was, it was, it's been a really challenging thing just having the surgery and kind of being stuck in a chair, icing all the time. <laughs> And my poor wife, she's like, she, she, we don't have three kids now, we have four. Because <laughs> she's trying to take care of me, you know? And so, so, so that happened. And then um, and, and, and then the other thing that happened is we actually had a friend on Thursday, for those of you who saw him, nervous, um, he was a dear friend of ours. Um, and his name was Jim Dungess. He actually was killed in a mountaineering accident in Scotland. And uh, he tragically lost his life. He took a fall on... on, on uh, yeah, and, uh, what's the name of the team? Ben Nevis. Ben Nevis. He took a fall, and in the fall, he, he tumbled, um, and he didn't survive the injuries. And so he was a, a good friend of uh, many of us here, and uh, uh, a good friend of Amy and I. He worked for Strong for five years. Um, he was just an amazing, amazing man of God. We learned a lot from this man, and 58 years old. And it, it, it's, it's a blind side. And then on um, Friday this week, um, just so you know, Mary and I talked about it. We, we did find out that Mary was um, uh, medically diagnosed with uh, um, stage four cancer. And so it is, it is a, obviously a serious diagnosis. Um, it, according to the doctor, it is um, in, in the lymph nodes of her chest and in her spine and in her bones. And so. Uh, Medically, it, it cannot be cured, but it can be treated. Did I get that correct? It can, can be controlled. It can be controlled. And so um, we're kind of looking at, wow, what's, what, what is Mary's future going to look like? Because, you know, we have a, our, our father-in-law is in Mexico, and, he, you know, he's battling MS. And um, there's a lot of circumstances and situations where we're like, how, Lord, how, how is this going to work out? How are we going to move forward? In the future, and Friday was a very, very heavy day. It was heavy on Amy. It was heavy on Mary. It was heavy on Andrew. Um, it, it was heavy on Drew. It was just a super heavy day. And um, I can honestly say, as we pressed in to the Lord and in one another, we, we feel like that heaviness is lifted. Um, I was on the phone with Mono on Friday, and then we got to pray, and I just kind of broke down praying because it was just so heavy. You know, because here's one of our loved ones, a matriarch in this family, in this city. Like, these guys have pioneered. They, 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 they founded Harvest Church. You know, they, 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 they have risen awesome children. They founded Strong. They've risen awesome children. And they're, in a way, they're founding this church through their sons and daughters. You know, and, and here we see this threat on her life. And it's like, no, God, this isn't, this isn't, no. It's been heavy. And honestly, we're at a point in time where either we're going to allow our circumstances or situations we're facing overwhelm us, determine our joy, determine our peace, determine the quality of life, or we're going to take a stand and believe Jesus for what he did on the cross, reach into heaven and pull the glory of God down in the circumstance situation. And this is what Jesus is saying. The only work he's called his believers to do is this, believe in the one he sent. That's it. Everything else you receive, and there's no work. You receive it freely. The work is believing in the one he sent and believing in what he purchased on the cross for your life, for your circumstance right now. 
And so we grew in practice in this Hebrews 10, 26, where we, we're like, we're saying that we're going to hold tightly, unwavering to the hope we confess, Jesus our Lord. For we know that our God is faithful to fulfill every promise. And there's promises over Mary's life that are unfulfilled yet. And so we're at this, we're, we're at this junction where it's like, okay, either we're going to let these circumstances overwhelm us, or we're going to overwhelm the circumstances with his goodness. And Jesus makes it very clear on how to do that through prayer. Okay? So, we all know this. I, I want to be sensitive of time. But we all understand dominion was restored back to you through Jesus Christ. Right? The first Adam lost dominion. The second Adam regained all dominion. Now, Jesus regained all dominion through what he did on the cross for you. Now he's exercising his rule and reign through you on this earth by the Holy Spirit. If you look at the life of Jesus, there were two distinctions. One, he was fully dependent on his Father. Scripture says he never did anything apart from the Father. He couldn't do anything. He did it as a man. So that we too could do as men. He did it in right relationship with his heavenly father. Right? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So now, what's the difference between Jesus and you? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Where he washed you with his blood. He has now put you in perfect right relationship with his heavenly father. Now the question remains, how dependent are you going to be on the Holy Spirit? Does this make sense? Okay, so Matthew 28, 19. The Great Commission. Here he is with the disciples. He gives the Great Commission. Before he said go, he said something really important. Matthew 28, 19. It says this, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and what? On earth have been given to me. Okay. When I was sitting in my chair icing, <laughs> being like, Lord, we need breakthrough. I, I was feeling the weight of the circumstances and situations we were facing. I felt like the Lord really asked me to go to this and said, I want you to see how much authority I truly have. And it, it was very, it just it popped out to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, when Jesus says all, he literally means all. I looked up the Greek word. It means all. Okay? It means everything. But I love how the Greek explains it. It means from beginning to end. And then it goes on to say, I love this. I love this. The total picture that takes place one piece at a time. So when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, He's saying, listen, I've got it from the beginning to the end, but I also am giving you my authority for the circumstances and situations you're facing one at a time. So he's giving me and he's giving you all the authority he has in heaven on this earth to rule and reign with him, big picture, in every circumstance and every situation you'll face. And this is how the Lord is wanting to redeem back his planet through his sons and daughters, one person at a time, one cir circumstance and situation at a time that is setting itself up against the goodness of God. That's it. This is the gospel. This is the good news of the kingdom. So, now, the Lord's prayer is one of the clearest instructions on how we enforce this. In Matthew chapter 6, it's one of the clearest instructions on how to bring the reality of his world in heaven, on earth, into ours. Okay? One circumstance in one situation at a time. So we're going to look at this. Okay? So as I, as I was sitting in my chair, I just felt like the Lord being like, listen, one circumstance, one situation at a time. I put it all on my son Jesus. 
I sealed it at the cross. 2,000 years ago, Mary was sealed at the cross. Now I need you to reach into heaven and pull that reality into her life. That takes courage. And that takes faith. And that takes what the Bible describes as enduring faith, faith that doesn't let go. Okay, so can we pull up that uh, PowerPoint? So if you look here, I, I kind of put this out. Now, when establishing heaven and earth, when bringing his kingdom into our, king, uh, into our realm, okay, when believing God for breakthrough, okay, there are two priorities he modeled in prayer. Number one, intimacy with the Father that is expressed through worship. Exactly what we did this morning. Number two, bringing his kingdom on this earth. So I, I tried creating a chart for a visual so that we don't get stuck in a real prayer of words, but rather a way of life. Okay? So if you look, everybody says, Father in heaven, Father in heaven. Holy, is holy is your name. Here's the deal. That phrase right there, okay, is not just a phrase you say, it's a life you live. All right. How many know there is a big difference between being able to recite something versus actually do something? <laughs> Raise your hand if you know that, right? <laughs> okay. Where, where, where's Bob? Bob. Bob is a world famous Western artist, right? Yeah. Amazing. I am a proud owner of a Bob Seebeck original. <laughs> Bob, don't die. But I know when you do, it'll be worth millions. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> okay. So, Bob Seebeck. Bob could give you clear instruction on how to paint a magnificent painting. He could break it down in probably five easy steps. And you could be like, okay, I need to do this. I need to make these lines. I need to grid this thing out. I need to pick these colors. And I need to paint this. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? He could break it down in six easy steps. And you could tell him back the exact steps he, he gave you, right? You can recite it. But then, when you have the canvas, and you actually have to do it, it comes out like a stick figure. <laughs> right. My six-year-old daughter does better than me on stick figures at this point in time. Right. It's like, wow, there's a huge difference between saying something and being able to recite something and actually doing something. And, and honestly, I've been really feeling convicted like the Lord's just been asking me, man, I gave you this tool so you can't rec don't, don't recite it so you rule and reign with me as a son of glory. And so, let's look at this. Father in heaven, holy is your name. This right here is a phrase. It's not something you just recite. It's a life you live. The word Father is a title of absolute honor and a call to relationship. It's a title of a position you hold now because of who you are in Christ Jesus. See, you, are, you were a slant sinner cleansed by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now you're a son or daughter that has no more separation from your Father in heaven. And because of the position you hold in Jesus, through his sacrifice, he successfully dealt with the power of sin and the effect of sin that is on your life and surrounding your life. Now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, nothing separates you from the Heavenly Father, and two, nothing now separates you from His resources. 
So when we come before the Lord and say, Father in heaven, it's not just this thing where we say, Father God. No, it's saying, Papa, my daddy, the one who I'm in perfect relationship with because of what Jesus did for me and who has every answer and resource available for me at his fingertips. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of unbroken access. Let me give you an example. Anka, Adam, and Elise, right? The only three people on this planet who have the true biological right to call me Papa, right? And because they have that right, what? They have unbroken access to me. They come to me and I'm like, I love you. I mean, I, I love it how, right now, how Adeline will just come when we're washing the shoes and she loves and just snuggle. Like, that's it. And I'm okay with that. Because she's, I'm modeling to her. She's picking up on the presence of God. She's watching her daddy worship with all of his heart. That will rub off on her. That's going to teach her. But they have unlimited access to me. And they not only have unlimited access to me, but day and night. Yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> right? Yeah, day and night. Exactly. It's, it's, it's constant, morning, noon, and night. You know, I was like, Daddy, can we play? Yes, I'll drop it all. I'm going to play with you. Daddy, can we play balls? I don't care what we play. I just want to be with you. So not only do they have access to me, but they have access to everything I have. And as a matter of fact, they're the inheritors of our will. A fortune, right? <laughs> the massive one. <laughs> they won't believe it for God. But the position they hold, yeah, right? Basically, my choice, Lord, that one's on you. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, my, my point is this. They, they, they are the inheritors of everything. Everything. I will make sure every need is met. So the word father is more than just a term, you know, God. It's, it speaks of relationship and resources. Okay? So we father in heaven, what's next? Holy is your name. Okay. What Jesus did for you on the cross to know God as a perfect loving father is the one need for you to become a true worshiper. All worship starts with sonship and intimacy. Does that make sense? So when my daughter comes to me, I love this. Oh my gosh. This is like my favorite thing. One of my favorite things. She'll come up to me and she'll be like, Daddy, come here. And she goes, she comes down and she's looking at me and then she just reaches around and goes, and gives me a kiss on the cheek. What does my heart do? <laughs> like, like, it like explodes. I, I had no clue this much love could flow out of me. Well, what happens when we minister to the Father with our hearts? And we choose to kiss him with our love and our affection. His heart begins to increase and expand and explode towards his children. This is what the scripture means. He inhabits the praises of his people. He doesn't just fill it because, oh, cool, they're praising me. Yeah, yeah, He fills it because he's like, oh, my gosh. I love them. And they love me. Is this making sense? So, worship is the number one priority in ministry. It's the greatest call of every believer. It's the supreme call. It's the call that's above all other calls. To fear God and give Him glory. Because the work of ministry to the Lord will always unlock the works of the ministry of the Lord. Does that make sense? So, just like my daughter, when she comes and gives me a kiss, my heart goes, Wah! what does it do? It unlocks this ministry to her. Now, I'll always provide, give her what her needs, but, you know, I'll always make it happen, but there's something that happens when she ministers to me that just makes me come alive. God has feelings. Right? And it's so important we understand the priority 
of knowing him as a father and then taking up the role and responsibility of ministering to him. Now, Psalm 22, 3 says this, But you are holy and thronged on the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of his people and responds with a literal invasion of himself when the people of God choose to praise him. I love this. Isaiah 42, 12. This is one of my favorites right now. It says this, Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise a battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. What is the enemy of God? It's the same enemy that comes against you. It's Satan and his works, it's sin, it's the power of sin, the effects of sin, which is cancer, which is sickness, which is disease, which is poverty, which is natural disasters, which is broken relationships. The power of sin, the effects of sin, are the enemy of man, and it's also the enemy of God. And when we give him praise, the scripture says, the Lord raises up a battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. The Lord puts war on the things that are coming against you when you choose to praise. So when we just say, hey, Father, holy is your name, we're missing the whole point. That Father, holy is your name, it's a, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's a call to worship. When we come before him, I'm going to worship you and worship you and worship you until I get the breakthrough. So, there are certain things in life you're not going to be able to get through, but there's nothing you can't worship your way through. So, now, the enemy will always come against your worship by getting, trying to get you stuck in unbelief. So, what did, what did the enemy tempt Eve with first? Did God really say? The two root sins of humanity, pride and unbelief. The two things... That gave sin its grip, its power, and its effect was pride and unbelief. So when you get caught in circumstances and situations, okay, the temptation is to, is to get sucked down. Man, did God really say this? I thought God said long life. I thought God said that I would be on top of mountains bringing the gospel all over the world. Now it's still going to happen. But like, all of a sudden, the enemy comes in and starts lying and, and counteracting against what you thought God said. How many of you have ever experienced that in life? Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the war. The war is between your ears. Okay? The only reason why the, the enemy has power is when we give him power through our agreement. So... We have to start training ourselves to recognize, wow, I'm getting sucked in unbelief. Now, unbelief just isn't unbelief or I don't believe in nothing. It's actually faith in the wrong thing. So when I was sitting here in the chair, and man, you know, struggling with this, and then just found out my friend died, and then, um, and knowing that Mary had cancer, there was this weight of unbelief that got on me, and I couldn't shake it off. It's just like, God, what is going on? How many of you have experienced that? And you feel this weight. It's just like this oppression, this discouragement. It's this heaviness. And I couldn't shake it in 20 minutes. That was the thing. It was like, I would get a little bit, ah. Oh, I'd go up, down, up, down. I'm just being real and honest, because you're I'm pretty darn good at this, actually. Like, I'm not trying to brag, but I can, I can recalibrate pretty quick, right, Will? Um, but in this case, it was, it, was, it was tough. I wasn't doing a good job. It was like up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, in and out, in and out. And, and, and I realized, like, man, I have got to go to a whole other level of worship. Because I'm, I'm stuck in the burden of unbelief. Okay? And I, and I felt the Lord speak to me, Josh, you right now are carrying the burden of unbelief rather than the burden of the Lord. And, and so on, on uh, Thursday, Amy was like, you have to s s rest. You have to stop. And so she, her and Mary went and did something, and then she, we got somebody to watch Elise all day, and then we had an auto come out and drop off, and I was able to just sit there. And basically, 
what I did, I just started pressing in for like two hours and just worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. And I wasn't feeling it. Even tough guys came and like, they knocked on the back door because they needed to figure out what the heck they needed to know. And I'm like sitting here like shouting before the Lord. I think the girl's like, oh gosh, is this guy okay? Like, <laughs> you know? And I'm just worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. But it, 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 it was like a few hours. And I was just pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing it. But I started to notice over time, it, the weight of the burden of unbelief started shifting to the weight of faith and hope. And it didn't happen right away, but I kept continuing. I kept continuing. I kept continuing. See, this is the difference between true prayer and worship versus just complaining. So many times people will come before the Lord with the circumstance and situation they're facing and they, they put it before the Lord, but they, they rehearse it over and over and over again. And it turns out in a complaining session and they don't leave changed. If you're human, you've probably experienced it. Raise your hand if you've experienced that, right? Okay, here's what you need to do. You don't get out of Father in heaven, holy is your name. You stay there. And you keep worshiping, you keep pressing in, you keep being like the cherubim and seraphim who are these creatures who, who are covered in eyes and they have one job description. They fly around the throne room looking at the king of glory saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who will come. He gave you spiritual eyes to see him so you know the hope he's called you to, the riches of what it means to be a saint and uncomparable great power for those who choose to believe. This is why worship has to be your number one priority. And you worship until the burden of your unbelief turns into the weight of his glory. And you don't back off until you get the breakthrough. For some, it'll take five minutes. For others, it may take a week. As long as you get there, get there. <laughs> and guess what? Over time, as a church family, we'll get better and better and better at this. This is why we've been practicing the life model. Okay. So, I love what Derek Prince says. He, he's, in case you don't know who Derek Prince is, he, he was a, kind of a, uh, a major teacher in the body of Christ. Um, years ago, he's with the Lord now, but he coached many generals today. He would say this, anytime I would pray for an hour, I'd worship 50, pray for 10. Whenever you pray for that, you'd worship 50, pray for 10. <coughs> Father in heaven, holy is your name. Okay, so let's go to the next. We're going to speed this up. So once we get the breakthrough of sonship, intimacy, praise, worship, then you go into taking dominion through one circumstance situation at a time. Don't, don't, don't go into the war until you build the strength to fight the battle. Does that make sense? Don't even pray until you can pray in faith. Gaze upon him until you grow in faith. So it's, it's when you get here, okay, that that faith actually becomes specific and focused, okay? It's, it's here where faith will grab a hold of the reality now that you have the breakthrough of the Lord is showing you that he wants to do. So... The will of God is always seen in the ruling presence of God. Does that make sense? Where his presence is, so is his will. This is why Jesus taught us to start with worship, and then he taught us to pray with the standard as it is in heaven. Okay? As it is in heaven is the fulfilled word of God. Does that make sense? Okay, is there sickness in heaven? No. Is there depression in heaven? No. Is there evil in heaven? No. Are there natural disasters in heaven? Is there a financial crisis in heaven? No. If it's not free to exist in heaven, then it's not free to exist here on earth. 
And through prayer, we exercise the authority that Jesus gave us. This is why he said, your kingdom come, the domain of Christ, the domain of the king, your will be done on earth, what? As it is in heaven. So if, you're, if you feel the breakthrough in your heart, okay, I got faith, but I still have confusion. Just think, okay, what's going on in heaven? It, and then according to what's going on in heaven, now you pray that into earth. Does that make sense? So Mary could be like, you know what? Cancer, that's the will of God. No! Why? Because it doesn't exist in heaven. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was put upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's a present tense word. Mary was healed at the cross 2,000 years ago. She's healed in heaven. Now, we reach into heaven and say, as it is in heaven, we command that to manifest here on her body now. So, this is what Jesus is talking about, and I'm going to be wrapping it up here, in Matthew 16, when he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Matthew 16. Listen to this. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. How many of you have ever heard that scripture? Matthew 16. He doesn't just say, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What does he say? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he gave you the command, heaven on earth. So, then it goes on to say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Notice the phrase, shall be. The implication here is this. What is bound and loosed here is what already has been bound and loosed there. So now you can pull down what's done there to here because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and your circumstance situation. Is this making sense? All of a sudden, the Lord's Prayer becomes like, wow, this is awesome. Okay, so let's just go on. So, now, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some people pray this as a request, but you can actually pray as a declaration or a military act. And this is something I've been practicing. Over Mary, we take communion. And then instead of saying, okay, God, would you please send your kingdom and your will be done as it is in heaven, we say, no. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God, be done. And we do it as a declaration over her. Or we do it as a declaration over our finances. Or we do it as a declaration over our children. Uh, there's, been, there's been a couple times I've been, when the girls fall asleep, I go and I just put my hand on their chest while they're sleeping. And I just simply put, just come in, kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. What am I doing? I'm exercising authority over their lives and bringing heaven to earth. Just yesterday, I was walking through Walmart to go get a haircut. Kingdom of God, come in this place. Will of God be done in this place. He told me everywhere I put my foot, he gives me the land. So now, kingdom of God, where I put my foot, come. Will of God be done. What am I doing? I'm exercising dominion. Is this making sense? So now, let's try this. I want you to declare this. I want, let's say this all together. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God, be done. Okay. Pause for a second. I want you to think of just one thing. Okay? Right now. You got it? And on the count of three, we're going to do this together. And we're going to declare, Kingdom of God, come. Will of God, be done. Ready? One, two, three. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. Boom. A military act. So you can do this throughout your day. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. Here, as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Lord, you said no cancer in heaven. Now kingdom of God, come. No cancer here. And how does the kingdom come? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's keep going here because of time. So, intimacy with the Lord, we worship and pray until the weight of faith, the weight of His presence fills us. We get the word of the Lord, and then we begin to take dominion. Kingdom of God come, will of God be done. Okay? 
What has been bound in heaven can be bound here. What has been loosed in heaven can be loosed here. Okay? Then, if you look, one, two, and three. And I, I try to make this up so people can see. When it says, give us today our daily bread, that's heaven's effect on every need you have. What is, what is, what is, what is the standard of heaven for supply? Abundance. Okay? That's why I do not believe in poverty. God wants to bless his children abundantly. That's why starvation is not of God. He provides for his sons and daughters. So when we live in an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father, we pick up this role of worship, and then we become enforcers of his kingdom, his will, as it is in heaven, on this earth. What's the effect we have? Abundant supply. This building is an example of abundant supply. The number of people versus the cost of this building doesn't make sense. At all. It's a supernatural picture of God's favor and provision. It's also a picture of restoration. We start with the inside and then we move outside. <laughs> okay? So, number one, heaven's effects on material needs. Give us today our daily bread. Number two, heaven's effects on our relationships. Forgive us our sins as we choose to forgive those that sin against us. How many have had a relationship that's in struggle? It's like, man, this is hard. Lord, there's no unforgiveness in heaven. There's no uh, uh, divorce in heaven. There's no brokenness in heaven. So right now, I take authority over the situation. I say, kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. Do you see how it works? Heaven's effect on relationship is real. Third, heaven's effect on our relationship with evil. Keep us from the evil or protect us from the evil one. Okay? Jesus said, Satan has no hold on me. He has no strong hold on me. The power of sin, the effects of sin, of every believer is to be completely removed because of his goodness. Is this making sense? Okay, so. Now, if you look, it starts with worship, intimacy, prayer. Worship, intimacy, sonship. Then we go into dominion. Then the Lord meets the needs as we declare, kingdom of God come, will of God be done. And then what does it wrap up again? Worship, intimacy, sonship. The Lord is the kingdom, and yours is the glory, forever and ever. So be it. Raise your hand if this makes sense. Raise your hand if you've heard this before. Kind of? Kinda. All right. What this is, this is a way of life. This is not just a rote prayer we pray. So now, here's the application. It's 11.15. We're going to want to pause. So, what I want you to do is take a minute right now and just make a list of every circumstance and situation you are facing that is not as it is in heaven. Okay? Now, some people are like, well, I have a serious list. All right? Just list the top three, okay? All right. We live in a fallen world that's being redeemed. Okay? We live in an orphan world that the Father is bringing back to himself. Okay? That means there are going to be problems. I want you to make a list, a couple, a couple things. Everybody knows what they are. All right? Now, we'll take a few minutes to make this list. Well, if you want, we can play a little music. And... Thanks, Dad. Next to those things, I want you to just next to it write as it is defined in heaven. Right? On earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 16. What has been loosed in heaven can be loosed in earth. What has been bound in heaven can be bound on earth. Now write the opposite of that. As it is in heaven.
So an example of this in Mary's case, we bind cancer in Jesus' name and we release healing. Right? That's an example. Some people are writing a little bit. So I want to provide the time, but I also want to be sensitive to time. So here's what I want us to do now. We're going to just stand up and we're going to just worship for a couple minutes. And I want you to worship until you feel a little bit of a faith, a release. Where a, a light, I like to say where the burden of the unbelief is no longer there, but the burden of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. You're in faith. When you get that little breakthrough, then I want you to take this list and just before you and God say, God, you said, you just use Mary's example, no cancer in heaven. So now I release, I bind cancer in Jesus' name and I release healing in Jesus' name. And after you do that, declare, kingdom of God, come. And will of God, be done. Does that make sense? And then you do it until you feel like, man, I just got to look through. And then you just worship again, knowing that he gives good gifts to his children. Can we do that? All right, let's stand up. So when you feel released, go for it. And then I want you practicing this throughout the week. Every circumstance, every situation, everything you're facing, 